Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our study in search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And I want to greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're just glad that we can be together with you, even, even as it is digitally, electronically, video optically. Uh, you know, it's uh, not a great substitution for being face-to-face -face with you, but we'll take what we can get. Hallelujah. Um, I want to start by saying, I want to make this a reminder in the beginning, because I said it's really a good idea, in addition to having your Bible handy, because you want to test the things that I say, to have a notepad and pencil so you can jot down notes, jot down scripture, verse references, uh, so you can look those up later, or, or what have you. And because if you have comments or questions about the study, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash in search of Christianity and participate in this study because we will respond to anything that you, any questions you have or comments you have for sure. All right. Last, in our last program, we talked about Christianity being defined by a word, and that word was love. What I want to talk about today is love. That's I want a very broad. It's, it's, it's an incredibly broad subject, yeah. but it is the found. As we talked about last time, it's a foundation. It is Christianity. That's what we. That's what we said. You know, Christianity in a word is love. So we have to have it. Will never hurt us to grow in our understanding from Scripture of what love is. Okay, so that's what we're going to do a little bit. We're going to we're going to look at Christianity and, and say now we're going to look at love and say okay. Let's define love. Mm -hmm. How do you? What is love? And there are simplistic answers, and there, you know, the only ones that matter are those that come from the Word of God. That's right. Okay. So I mean, I could just sit here and read from Paul's writing in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and that would be an accurate description, but it wouldn't be, I don't think, the fullness of what God wants us to get. Amen. Because remember, this is about finding real Christianity in a time when there is so much that cannot be real Christianity, if it is absolutely the presence of Christ in the world today through his people, okay? Yes. So the first thing that I want to talk about with love is it's about gift, okay? The gift of loving. God is giving from the very beginning. Where's a good place to start in the beginning? In the beginning. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning. But it says in Genesis chapter 1 that God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea, mm -hmm. over the birds of the sky and the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 1.26. So God gave man dominion. Then God gave him provision. Because it goes on, a few verses later, Genesis 1.29, and God says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding its seed, it shall be food for you. So God, I mean, from the very beginning, God is giving yes. to man. Yes. Bear in mind that he says he made the earth to be inhabited by man. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a gift. gift. And <laughs> one that we probably abuse like we abuse most of them. Okay, so anyhow, after the fall, after Adam sinned, mm -hmm. after his disobedience, God gave us later, as promised, the fruit of Jesus' obedience. God gave us the great gift. Yes. What's the great gift? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 that's the great gift. Eternal life. But it's from because of love. God's love motivated him to give. All right? So the first thing that we need to know about love is that it's giving. 
Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. I want to give you six facts. Not F-A-X. F-A-C-T-S. Mm -hmm. All right? And these are all from the first letter of John in chapter 4. So if you want to turn to that, be my guest. I'm going to read these things, starting with John, 1 John 4, 8. I want to read. It says that God is love. Yes. Okay? It's not that he has love. Not that he, he is love. All right? And then it goes on and it says, love comes from God. And it says, we love because he first loved us. The fourth thing is, loving one another perfects his love in us. All right? That, these are all from, like I say, from 1 John chapter 4. There is no fear in love. And whoever, the last one is, whoever loves God must love his brother. Yes. Okay? So these are things, if you're going to look at love, you have to consider those, those things as a starting point, I say. God is love, God gives. Case closed. Okay, we can all go home now. <laughs> Let, but let's look at a few of those clo more closely. Mm -hmm. All right? Love comes from God, it says. Right? Yes. I've used this verse probably a dozen times already in, our, in the first few programs that we've done. From Paul's writing to the church in Romans, Romans 5, I'm going to read verses 3 and through 5. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So love comes from God. His love has been poured into us. Mm -hmm. And when I say us, remember I said this, I think, last week's, in last week's program, and I want to make this clear. This program, this, this search for true Christianity, this is not for the unsaved. Now, if there are people that are, are watching, listening to this, and don't know Jesus Christ, I pray that something in His Word will be a seed planted that will touch your life and draw you to Him. But this is about the church understanding what the church is supposed to be according to the Word of God, not according to man's traditions, not according to what we feel like, but according to God's words. The next thing is love stimulates love. Right? It says we, we love Him because He first loved us. His love stimulated, stirred up, brought about that love for Him in our lives. Okay? Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. As a man, whatever a man sows, so he will also reap. All right? What you put out, you're going to get back. Now, that doesn't mean when you give God's love to somebody else, that that person is going to return that love to you. It doesn't mean that. It, I promise you, not everybody is going to be receptive to the love of God that you present to them. Not, not everybody, but somebody. All right? But I will tell you that God will always return that gift. When you are obedient and share the love of God, God is going to return love to you. I mean, you will know. You know, what we should be seeking is the approval of God in our lives. We want to please Him. That needs to be the end goal. Mm -hmm. You know, when we see Him face to face and meet Him eyeball to eyeball, that He says, well done, now faithful, good and faithful servant, right? Mm -hmm. Enter into the joy of your Master. But, let me see, three times in Scripture, you know, God the Father says, as over Jesus, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Yes. He, he shows that favor, and He demonstrates it, and He speaks. We want to hear that from the Lord. And a command that, that the Father gave at that point, too, was listen, listen to, to Him. him. Yes. And we talked about love. You know, if we... Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? right? Mm -hmm. Love perfects. Remember what I read from, from 1 John there? Let me read that verse, all right? Okay. Uh, 1 John 4, 12. No one has seen God at any time. 
If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Okay? Now, that lines up exactly with what Jesus prayed in the garden on the night he was taken, in John 17. I'm going to read from John 17. I'm going to read John 17, 22 and 23, right? This is Jesus speaking to the Father. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Speaking of the believers, right? Mm -hmm. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. We are perfected in that unity that only exists when we love one another. And I want you to know that when there is division in the body of Christ, that is imperfection in the body of Christ. And God will not tolerate imperfection in the body. He's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Right. That, per that imperfection has to go. The division that we so often boast about <clears throat> is imperfection in us. And my goodness gracious, may we never boast in imperfection. We're very proud of it. We should seek that perfection. In, in our lives. It can only come from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And His work in our lives will cause us to love one another. The next thing is, love nourishes faith. You know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will He find faith? Where does faith come from? Hearing Him. All right, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We need to be hearing Him. But love nourishes faith. Fear, remember it says, perfect love casts out fear. Well, fear is the opposite of faith. That's cast out. Think about the connection here to love. And the best place that I could think of to, to see that, really, was in Romans chapter 8, Paul's letter to the Romans, right? Because this is, this is Paul speaking out of the confidence that he has in God's love, right? I mean, that's what that whole chapter is about. Paul is his confidence in God's love. In Romans 8, 28, you know, I'm sure you all know this verse. He says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Right. When we have that confidence that everything in our lives works to good because he loves us, why would, you have, why would you fear anything? Right? And that's why he goes on in Romans 8, 31 and 32 in that same chapter. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? What do you have to be afraid of? And that's based on love. Right? So that love nourishes, builds up, encourages faith in our lives. And the fear will be built up because they're listening to the world. Because you will choose, you will choose to either listen to the word mm -hmm. or listen to the world. One brings fear, one brings faith. It's your choice what you yes. choose. That's why Jesus said, be careful yes. what you listen to. And last in that chapter that I want to read, you know, in Romans 8, is the 37th verse, when Paul says, but in all these things, talking about all of the tribulations, the afflictions, the, the, the attacks, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who yes. loved us. It's all based on love. When you know that God loves you, and I'm talking about the real deal here, yes. The depths of your soul. You that's that's why this man, Paul, literally, literally turned that world upside down. Because he was so confident of God's love in his life. He said, nothing, nothing can separate me from the love of God. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. When you know God's love, when you are confident of God's love in your life, it will change everything in your life. Next thing is, and this is really important, love is dependent on selflessness. Yes. You cannot 
Love and selfishness can't coexist. Okay? They won't. I, I just want to look at the history of the early church. And we're not getting too crazy about all of this. But the, I think it's important to see the transition of the early church. In Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read you from Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them with all as anyone might have need. That early church, now remember, Jerusalem had lots of need. I mean, just read, read the Gospels. Read the book of Acts and see the lame, the hungry, the beggars. All right? There was plenty of need around, except within the body of believers back then, there was no need because of the selflessness of the believers. And love for one another. And their love for one another. And then again, in Acts chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 32 through 35. And the congregation of those who believe were of one heart and soul. No division there. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. That's, that's selflessness. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. That selflessness coupled with the word of God changes things. Then it says, for there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each one as any had need. Think of that verse. My goodness gracious. And this comes from selfless love. Where can you go in the world that you know today and hear it honestly say, there was not a needy person among them? That was the case in the early church for a time. Because of truly selfless love. Okay? But then, in Acts chapter 6, if you read Acts chapter 6, and you should read Acts chapter 6, uh, I'm going to give you what is a very different take, what you'll typically hear. So I encourage you to test what I say. Don't take my word for anything. Check the word, have a conversation with the author of the word, have a conversation with the word, and see if what I say is true. Before you go into 6, did you bring out the point in 2? where they were seeing the need? Okay, All right. Alice makes a, a valid point. What she's talking about is there's a difference, and you know, I've asked a lot of people this, do you see the difference between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4? Mm -hmm. See, in Acts chapter 2, it says that the believers, if they saw anybody in need, they went and they took care of it. Right. In Acts chapter 4, there's a subtle change taking place in the structure of the church. Mm -hmm. Because now what's happening, they're taking what they, their abundance and giving it to the apostles, and the apostles are distributing it as people have need. Okay? There's, that's a, that's a, a, a difference it's, that's taking place. It's very subtle. Well, it's subtle. But significant. But I'll tell you why it's significant. Yeah. Because when you, start, when you get to chapter 6, you go from chapter 2 to chapter 4 to chapter 6. In chapter 6, it says this now. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Okay? Now, if you read that whole chapter, you'll see that how they deal with this. You know, basically they say, the apostles say, well, let's hire waiters. You guys, you know, says to the congregation, you guys pick seven waiters from among you. All of a sudden, you understand? You see this division here. Yes. There's two groups. Now they're talking about they had communion, they had common meals together, and it says they're, they're increasing in number. Well, praise God for that because the Lord was adding to the number day yes. by day yes. because of the preaching of the word. But it says way back in Deuteronomy, it says the more they increased, the more they reflected, the more they sinned. 
what he said. Yeah. You have division, okay? You have the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Why, why are we just calling it believers? Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden it's not just the believers. It's this group of Jews against that group of Jews, all right? And it says that one group, their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the apostles say, well, let's, you know, pick from among yourselves, seven, basically to be waiters, to distribute the food. Well, if the problem was the distribution of the food. They didn't say, well, we need to go down to the store and buy more food. That means there was enough food for everybody because God supplies. The problem was, that means that at one table, you have somebody sitting with abundance of food and somebody sitting at another table with a lack of food because there's enough food. That's what happens when selfishness sets in, when because you see, love they looks... They stop seeing need amongst themselves. Well, I'm going I'm to tell you something, you know, and I've said this a lot of times. You look at the people you love. Right. It shouldn't be a difficult challenge for you to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith, because you love Him. You know, I've said this, when I, we're in places and I'm, I'm, I'm ministering or we're in big groups at conferences, and Alice walks into the room, my eyes immediately go to Alice. I, you know, I've, I'll never apologize for that. I see her walk into a room and my heart pitter patters and beats faster. <laughs> because you'll look at the one you love. And it says if you see your brother in need, we're supposed to see the need of our brother because we love them. But here you got one group, and if they're seeing the need, they don't care about the need. If they're not seeing the need, it's because they don't care about them. It's one or the other. And all of a sudden, selfishness sets in. We have to be, selfishness is the enemy of love. And selfishness is the enemy, it is the deadly enemy of Christianity. That's why Jesus said you got to deny yourself. You're going to follow me, you have to deny yourself. You're going to follow me, you have to deny yourself. There is no place in the body of Christ for selfishness. We're not, you know, we are individuals, but we are all part of a body. That's right. And that is not being encouraged, in, that truth is not being encouraged in the church today. It's about me, about, about, about me, about me, about me. You see, we're in the perilous last days. I believe that with all my heart. And one of the characteristics, one of the signs of those perilous last days, when Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, in those perilous last days, right? In the last days, perilous times will come. He said, men will be lovers of self. Men will be lovers of money. Men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It goes on, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at it. What happens is... Lovers of self, that's that's just a, a, a different way of saying selfish. Yes. Okay. Or, or prideful. Well, because it's... it's you're focusing well, on your, you're, your own needs. You love yourself because you think more of yourself than you ought to. Mm -hmm. You think more of yourself than you do of that brother over there or that sister over there. And the Word of God says, don't do that. Mm -hmm. Don't think more of them than you are. More, you, know, you should think less of yourself than you do of them. That's what the Word of God says. It's clear. So where is it in the church? You know, we're at a time when I see upside-down stewardship being taught in the church. Yes. What I mean by that is that the, so much of the church today is teaching a selfish giving mm -hmm. that is not giving at all. You know, planting a seed and entrusting God with what belongs to you. Mm -hmm. This is, I, I want to tell you, I know that it says in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, give and it shall be given to you. The question is, what are you giving? You know, if you're giving ten dollars to this, are you giving ten dollars or are you giving love? You see, God is not sitting there with the little things on his arms and a little green meaning. Right. He's not an accountant. He is love. And his concern is love. And now you need to go to Romans to First Corinthians chapter thirteen and look at what love is. Alright? It's not selfish. It's not self serving. It's giving. So, and he, Paul says, if you, if you do, if you give everything, but don't have love, you're nothing. 
You're a clanging cymbal. That's right. Do you have the widow's might in there, or is that where you're going well, to? No, that's but that's part of it. You know, it's, it's interesting what Mark what Mark is mentioning. That Jesus is watching people come and bring their tithes, right? Mm -hmm. And he sees, you know, the Pharisees. They love their blowing trumpets and they're showing you know, how much they're giving. But a widow comes along and she's got two mites. A little teeny amount. And Jesus says she gave more than anybody. She gave a love. She gave out of her. You know, he didn't say, well, that's, that's life. Because he said that she gave more than anybody. Because it was her love that, that caused her to give that. Okay? When people are tithing or giving in order to get back more of the same money, that's not love. And I'm going to tell you, that's upside down stewardship. Half of these preachers that I hear talking about, well, plant your seed and God is going to multiply. You know, that's like, that's like getting a, an, what you're doing is you're entrusting money to God and trusting him to be a steward to return more to you. And if that's not upside down giving, I simply don't know what is. He is becoming your banker. Well, your yeah, he's becoming your servant. Your investment advisor. He's becoming your servant. Mm -hmm. He is managing money on your behalf. That's what you're looking for him to do. Rather than understanding that he's given us stewardship of what belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You don't own anything. That's right. He has given us stewardship. He has not given us ownership. If you don't like that, go Talk and write comments. Well, okay. yeah. Either go on our Facebook page and write your comments, or write. you can email. Email jesus at heaven.com and see what he has to say to you. Is ownership, stewardship, and possession somewhere on the Bible site? It probably is. Okay. That's, that's a study that I did on that, on that topic. Uh, which really is very worthwhile. Yes. But the, it boils down to when you're giving, is your, is your focus, are you giving the dollars? And then I would ask, if you're giving dollars, are you giving it to get more? Or are you giving love? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Jesus talked about giving without seeking return. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a fact. Like, like, like gravity is a law of God, that when you give, God's going to give back to you. But if you're giving love, he's going to give you back more love. Because the money doesn't matter. I was, he will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I was just thinking about the crisis and the tragedy in Nepal. And there are uh, so many people that are giving. And I'm sure it's not because well, they're looking for something in return. Well, there's a, yes, a I know. Amen. And that's, that should be our motivation. Right. Because that's the motivation of love. And that should be the way all the time. It should be the way all the time. So... The, when somebody, a preacher, abuses that, that's one of the most destructive things, Absolutely. not only to the church, but to the individual that is giving. The, he's, he is corrupting that individual. Yes. Okay. It's, and that's being taught all through the church today, yes. you know, planting a seed. Yeah. Just, just remember, it's about love. It's not about yeah. the money. Yeah. And if you're keeping track, you know, I gave $10 to God. He owes me, a, you know, 1000 yeah. Get over it. That's right. And Father, I just pray that we would all come to understand your love that's been poured into us more and more each day. And that love would be the focus of our life, that we would be used by you, open to be used by you, to touch lives around us with your love. That we would be truly ambassadors for you and ministers of reconciliation. Lord, help us to understand and to love more and more each day, starting with loving you more and more. I want more, Lord. I want more of your love. Hallelujah. All right. Don't forget, right? Give us your comments, your questions, and everything at Facebook. Facebook.com slash In Search of Christianity. God bless you. Far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners